Hello, students. So this is an attempt at something new. I'm uh, alone in my office talking into my iPad, and uh, that's not the new thing, um, but I'm recording it, which, which is. Um, so this is the MVC screencast, uh, 0.1 alpha beta. So we're discussing limits of functions of several variables, and we want to discuss how these limits can go right and, and how they can go wrong. So our ingredients, again, are a function of several variables, f. We've got the inputs approaching a point, a, b, here, and claiming that the output is l. And remember, this is saying that as the inputs get close to a, b, the outputs of our function, f, get close to l. Now, just to make our lives a little easier, it turns out it's easy enough to study these things if we make some simplifications. For example, we'll make the point that we want to approach uh, equal to the origin, 0, 0, and we'll uh, just take the output point uh, to be 0. It turns out if we can understand this case, we can understand the general case uh, just as easily. So here are five limits that we want to look at. They all involve functions of two variables. They are all functions that are continuous away from the origin. That means if the input were anything other than 0, 0, we could just plug it into the formula to find the limit. So we're going to look, of course, at what happens as x and y approach 0, 0. And as a hint, the answer in each case is either 0 or the limit does not exist. Well, each embodies some phenomenon about limits that we want to recognize uh, when we see it. The first one is the most straightforward. This is just a polynomial, x squared plus y squared. It couldn't be more smooth. It's continuous at every point. So of course, at the origin, the limit is 0. But I want to point out a few things about its graph. Its graph is a paraboloid. Again, this is a set of points where the z coordinate is the output of the function evaluate at the x and y coordinates. So what you're looking at here, though, is I want to observe that if the limit is 0, as it is in this case, if we approach 0 on any path, so the one depicted here is along the x equals the x-axis, uh, if we approach the origin along any path, we'll see 0. So if I switch to the y-axis here, and look down from above, as I approach from the y-axis, you can tell that the z values, the output values, are getting close to zero. And the same thing happens even if I change up the direction to y equals x. Or I make a curved path. Here's x equals y squared. Or something fun and spirally. I show you that because we're going to use these paths in subsequent examples. This example shows us that just checking limits along coordinate axes is not sufficient. Let's look at what happens when we set up a set of axes here. So these will be the inputs of the function. And let's check what happens to the values of the function as we approach along the x-axis. Now, algebraically, what this means is we're taking a limit, of course, as x goes to 0, but we're only going to look at f at the coordinates where x is 0 and y, where x is x and y is 0. Right? Those are these points. x is, takes on different values, but y is always 0 there. And so evaluating this algebraically is fairly straightforward. Just plug in x for x and 0 for y we get the expression limit as x goes to 0, 0 over x squared. We know in limits we don't take x to be 0, so this is just a constant 0. Up next, what we're going to check is this other direction. What happens as the values approach along a different line? y equals x. So we do something similar, algebraically. We set up the limit as x goes to 0, f, but now we evaluate it at both x and y coordinates are the same thing. So we can use x for both of them. We plug that in to our equation. We see we get x squared over x squared plus x squared, or more simply, evaluates to 1 half. So this limit certainly does not exist. We found two approaches giving different values. As soon as that happens, you can quit.
here's this crazy graph of this function, seeing some of this phenomenon. You see this sort of pinching action. And again, if we check our paths as we approach along the x-axis, we just get zero. Turns out the exact same thing is true. If we look along the y-axis, we still get zero for the output values. So both axes seem to imply the limit is zero. But as we saw, if we approach along y equals x, we get much greater values, up at one half. It's this weird ridge here. And just for completeness, if we check our curved paths, now this one kind of goes over the ridge and back to zero. And the spiral is, of course, interesting and does seem to converge, interestingly, to zero. None of these last are necessary. As soon as two paths give different answers to the limit, we say the limit does not exist. We start this next example by noting a fundamental fact about functions, namely that if we're looking for the limit of a function and trying to show that it's zero, it's absolutely equivalent to show that its absolute value is zero. And that's only because any number is close to zero if and only if its absolute value is close to zero. So then what we're going to do is take that absolute value, and plug in the formula for our function, and then I'm going to separate it out this way. And so it's the same as the absolute value, but I want you to concentrate on this second term here. At first it seems complicated. It's still a zero over zero expression at the origin. But note that away from the origin, if we look at the denominator, it's the numerator plus a positive term. So the denominator is bigger than the numerator. That's a fancy way of just saying this whole thing is less than or equal to 1. And so our f, absolute value of our f function, is the absolute value of x times something less than or equal to 1. So what this allows us to do is write a new inequality statement. 0 is less than the limit we're looking for, and that's because these values are never negative, so the limit can't be negative. But also this quantity is less than or equal to the limit of plain old absolute value of x. And the reason this is useful is because the thing that we're after, which seems kind of complicated, we now have pinned between two values that we know about, 0 on the left, and on the right, this is an easy limit. The absolute value of x has to go to 0 if the inputs are going to the origin. And we're left with a very funny looking but simple expression. 0 is less than or equal to the limit we're after is less than or equal to 0. Well, there's only one number between 0 and 0, and that's 0. Get rid of the absolute value signs, and we see that this limit is indeed exists and is 0. What we've just done is applied an important theorem called the squeeze theorem. I've also seen it called the sandwich theorem. And it says that if we have a function that's bounded both above and below by functions with a common limit, and so we know that the, there's an upper bound that's heading to L and a lower bound that's heading to L, well, then the conclusion is not too surprising. F has to go to L, too. This next example is the most pathological, and so, of course, it's my favorite. We're going to look again at the limit as the inputs uh, head towards zero, so we'll set up our axis as usual. And I want to test a bunch of lines as uh, the inputs go to zero, so... I'll do a couple, and maybe I'll choose y equals 0, and y equals x, and y equals 2x. Um, but then we'll do something that's really important in mathematics. We realize there's just kind of one parameter that we're varying here. So I want to kind of check all of them at once. I'm going to swap it out for a uh, variable, m. And I'll do my computation and leave m fixed for the whole um, computation, and then hopefully learn something uh, at the end. So I'm uh, going to take my limit as x goes to 0 now of f of x and y equals mx, literally. And so I just do the algebra. Now I'm going to go a little quickly here. Feel free to rewind if necessary or kind of skip to the end for the big reveal. So I plug in mx for y and I get this expression. Notice it's just a limit in one variable. So I can use my usual tricks. I'm going to factor out a common term 
uh, from numerator and denominator, and that's, so that's an x squared. It's going to come out of both um, sides. And so then, of course, I can cancel it out. And now I've got something slightly simpler to analyze here. Just this fraction, m squared x over 1 plus m to the fourth x squared. Um, and now to do this guy, I'm going to do something I've done before. I'm going to look just at the absolute value. Right? And I'll recognize that, of course, that limit has to be greater than or equal to 0. And then I'm going to notice that this denominator, again, is bigger than 1. We've got a positive term here. And so the denominator is bigger than 1. So this whole quantity has to be smaller than the numerator, um, m squared, absolute value of x. That's a limit we've seen before. It doesn't matter what value m is. That limit is 0. And so just as in the earlier example, I've got a limit squeezed, if you will, between 0 and 0. And so we can indeed conclude that this limit is 0. And so what about that m? Well, it didn't depend on m. This was true for every m. So I've got a function here, which from every direction looks like I get 0 as the limit. And it would be a sensible conclusion to say, oh, well, that must mean that the function's limit is 0. But hold on. I'm going to do something a little strange now. That previous computation only involved straight lines. And so now let's look at something curved. I'm going to choose the curve x equals y squared uh, for particular reasons you'll, you'll see here. Uh, now you could do this by parameterizing that line as x comma square root of x, but it's easier, I think, to just use y now. So we're going to send y to 0 along that curve, which means x is y squared and y is y. And I just do a little algebra as before. And this magically, this quotient works out to be y to the fourth over 2y to the fourth. You see that this limit is simply a half. So whereas we got 0 on every straight line approaching the origin, this funny meandering path in a curve led us to a limit of 1 half. All right, well, what could possibly be going on here? Well, we'll look at the graph in a second, but one thing you can certainly conclude is that this limit right here simply does not exist. So here's a graph of this weird function. You'll notice that uh, the limit is 0 if we approach on a straight line down the x-axis. And indeed, if we switch over to y equals x, we still see that the path sort of comes down the mountain and heads towards 0. So on this particularly strange path, right, x equals y squared, it's cooked up just right. It's going to stay on that upper ridge. And you see that its limit is a half, right, a bit half above everything else. So again, this is a very, it's a very strange behavior uh, at zero, but it just goes to show you that in functions of several variables, uh, limits can be a, a dicey affair. Finally, we arrive at this last example, which actually gives you some solid advice about what to try once you are convinced or that a uh, limit exists around zero. And the answer is um, to use polar coordinates. So these are different coordinates in the plane, where we use r and theta instead of x and y. These are the relations uh, between them, but you should interpret, of course, theta as the angle off the x-axis and r as the distance from the origin. Uh, um, that's key. And the reason that's key is because now any time we're examining a function of two variables where the limit heads to zero, we can actually translate that into polar coordinates and something rather remarkable happens. Remember that this definition means the input points are heading toward the origin. They can be arbitrarily close. Well, so when I translate into polar coordinates, all that means is that r is heading to zero. We've gone from a two-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem. Now, of course, I have to evaluate... Uh, well, actually, I can only need to use positive values for r, because in our coordinates we usually dictate that r is a distance, and so is non-negative. Now, for values of f, it's important that we evaluate them at the right point, but we just, again, use the formula for polar coordinates to do that. And we plug in r cos theta, r sine theta for x and y, uh, respectively. From there, it is just a 
comp a algebraic computation like in calculus one I plug in for my terms in this example x and y in particular that denominator should be a giveaway uh, it looks kind of complicated at first glance but you realize you get a whole bunch of cancellations cosine squared plus sine squared is one of course so I can factor out an r squared the radical gives me back to r because it's not negative and long story short that denominator there is nothing but good old r. So I've simplified this particular expression quite a bit. I'm going to cancel one power of r from numerator and denominator. And everything gets simpler still. I'm just looking at this limit here. Now the cosines are still hanging around, and you might ask, what are their values? Well, the nice thing, or difficult thing, depending on your perspective, is that it doesn't matter what their values are. For the limit to exist, this has to be true regardless of which theta. And that encodes the idea that you can approach zero from any path, from a straight path where theta is fixed to some really wacky path where theta varies all over the place. And in practice, what often happens is we just want to estimate that quantity. So the same trick that we've seen now a couple times will work again. We'll use absolute values for this expression and r is always non-negative, and we realize that cosine and sine, although since we don't know theta, don't know their values, but we can be assured of one thing, they're never bigger than one, right? And never smaller than minus one. So we can do a rather crude estimate. This whole quantity is simply less than r. Right? Cosine and sine, whatever theta does, can't multiply to a factor bigger than one. On the left-hand side, of course, we get zero. And then computing the right, that's the easiest limit there. So, well, maybe the second easiest limit there is. We get zero for that limit. So our conclusion then, therefore, be thought back in x and y coordinates, no matter how we approach the origin, because of this computation, the limit must be zero. And so to sum up, we've seen five different examples of limits of a function of two variables as the input approaches the origin, and the kind of things that can happen are, well, in the first case, very nice and easy, smooth function. The limit exists just by evaluation. Uh, in the third case, we saw the limit existed uh, by using the squeeze theorem directly. We bounded that whole thing by uh, absolute value of x. You see it's a little crinkly, but, um, but certainly continuous. Uh, the last example was also had existence, zero, the uh, graph is not all that informative, but again, we see an unpunctured, un untorn uh, surface, and so the limit exists at zero. The two that didn't exist, I guess the even examples, uh, we saw that as long as you can find two paths that either uh, that produce different limits or any one path that does not have a limit on your surface, um, the limit does not exist. So these kind of weird pinched uh, surfaces you can approach from different directions and get um, different values. Uh, certainly one instance in which a, a limit uh, does not exist. Uh, I hope this was helpful and uh, please give me some feedback in uh, your favorite forum um, if you'd uh, like to see more of these or, or, or not. Thank you.